Good morning. What a great way to start our Sunday morning service. Thank you to the choir. That was wonderful. Wanted to share with you just a few announcements, highlight a couple of them. The Quinnian Annual Banquet, that is the Christian Campus Ministry at Missouri Southern, will be this Thursday at 6.30. That is the group that I'm working with, also our prayer focus today. And if you want to hear some wonderful testimonies about how the Lord is moving at Missouri Southern, uh, we'd invite you to come to that. If you're interested to see myself or Patty Vavra uh, for more information, on that. Several other announcements, opportunities there in the bulletin. By way of prayer items, Koinonia again is our monthly prayer focus, and it's no secret in our world today the conflicts going on in the nations of Israel, Ukraine, Haiti, and Taiwan. Um, each of those countries and the people there could certainly use our prayers, and so we continue to lift them up as well. Would you pray as we start this morning and lift up those on our prayer list? Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the opportunity to be in your presence this morning and thankful uh, for the opportunity to listen to a wonderful choir, to hear the teaching of your word, and to break bread together. Father, we do pray for Koinonia Christian Campus Ministry, for the campus of Missouri Southern State University. Uh, Father, we pray for their leadership, and we pray for the students and for Koinonia. And then, Father, for areas of conflict in the world, for the countries of Israel, Ukraine, Haiti, and Taiwan, each with unique situations, we pray for them and for all that are involved. And, Father, for your presence and intervention and wisdom and guidance and all concerned. Father, we pray this morning for our church. We thank you uh, for the opportunity to be where we can study your word, and we lift up Mark as he leads us in the study uh, through your word this morning. We pray you open our hearts and minds to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our thoughts and our study will be on the idea of trials, various many trials that can come our way we face in life. I want to read a scripture from 1 Peter. The first part of this offers praise to God, and then it gives us um, some uh, a message for what we need to do in our lives, for what we may experience, and then a reason, a benefit that we may have from what we face when trials come our way. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. And that's where it uh, becomes a hard question. How do we rejoice in times of various trials that may come our way? But we're told what the benefit is in the next verse. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. I've chosen a couple hymns for us to sing that remind us that in all the things we face in life, in all of life's ebb and flow, we can still have joy, joy in knowing that we have the hope in the Lord. The first song is, Jesus is all the world to me. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without him I would fall. When I am sad to him I go, no other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad. There 
There is joy in serving Jesus as I journey on my way. Joy that fills the heart with music every hour of every day. There is joy, joy, joy in serving Jesus. Joy that throbs within my heart. triumphs over pain, fills my soul with heaven's music, till I join the glad refrain. There is joy, joy, joy in serving Jesus, joy that throbs within my heart, every moment, every Every Lord's Day at Park Plaza and thousands of churches, maybe millions of churches around the world, we join in sharing in the Lord's Supper what he has asked us to do. We have several guests with us this morning. We are so glad you're here. And we want you to know all Christians are welcome as we share in this time of the Lord's Supper, this time of communion, as Jesus asked us to do with emblems that represent um, his body and his blood. We want everyone to be able to share in this because we unite as his body together when we do this on the Lord's Day. We'll be singing a hymn that reminds us that at the cross, that's the place where we found our forgiveness. That's the place where we came to know Jesus at his cross. And through that, we have joy no matter what kind of trials we may face. Following singing of the hymn, Brother B.A. will come and bring us a communion meditation time and prayer. Let's sing the song at the cross. So 
Apostle John writes to uh, the churches of his day and all of our days, and uh, the Apostle of Love has a lot to say. Just some words here out of uh, chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. Dear friends, let us love. The word is agape, kind of love, the kind of love that God has. Let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love that... Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. There may be many ways that we might show our love for God. One of them he emphasizes here in this text, uh, even as it goes along, uh, that when we love others, that's He interprets that. God takes that as love toward Him. And there are many other ways that we might, in a specific way, show our love for Him. But I believe, certainly, there is no more important or significant way to show our love for God than when we bow in remembering He paid the price for us He has washed our sins away for us. We could never have done it. So it all comes down to if we don't do anything else, He wants to bring us to a remembering kind of commitment and a gratitude kind of commitment. And from that will spring all the other ways that we might show our love for Him. Can I say it again just one more time? There is no more important way, significant way, that we can show our love for God than to remember what He has done for us in saving us paying the price for us from all of our sins. Dear Father, help us understand how important this is for us, but help us to also understand how it may be very important for you to see and to know and for us to show our hearts in this simple way, and yet in a way that means more than we can ever understand if we ponder it a lifetime. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Look for the blessings. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you so much. First for you, thank you Jesus, and thank you Holy Spirit for your help. Uh, but we thank you for the blessings that you give us. And this morning I pray we look for the blessings, even though we have tough things to go through life too. We pray for everyone on our uh, list uh, in the bulletin and for others too there's going through hardships and things but let's be attentive now to your servant mark as he uh, talks about uh, having pure joy pure joy in all the testing and trials that we might have to go through which we all are going to go through in jesus name amen thank you gordon for your prayer today and uh, to sound a little Canadian, what do you think of Heidi's song, eh? That was pretty nice. That was pretty great. Now, Mom, uh, Grandmother Kathy tells me there's a little story behind that, and that is that when uh, Heidi was born, uh, she was, uh, there were some complications and some challenges and some trials. And that song was playing on the radio uh, when they would go back and forth to the hospital. So there's a little bit more to that song than maybe you first of all recognize. I want to thank too the choir for the great special this morning. When I first heard Shout to the Lord, we were on our sabbatical year in Colorado during the 97-98 school year. And uh, the, our church there, Boulder Valley, sang that song. And I fell in love with it. And I thought, I want that at my funeral. I'm telling you now. <laughs> so you won't forget. We have some special guests here today. I'm going to leave that introduction to a little bit later. Let's get rolling here this morning. I suppose it's no secret that sometimes we have a little trouble seeing far enough. 
Do you see far enough? Sometimes we don't see far enough. Uh, probably no surprise to anybody, uh, if you've looked at the thickness of my lenses, I have a significant refractory problem. I am nearsighted. It is difficult for me to see far without some help. It began in my freshman year in college, and I couldn't see uh, the chalkboard. Does anybody remember what a chalkboard even is? <laughs> And I thought, wow, why is that so blurry? And so I had to get some help. And I am significantly nearsighted. Some, now, at my age, I also need help up close. So can you say bifocals? But that's where we are in life. Some years ago, I went up to Haver, Montana. It's a little town about 50 miles south of the Canadian border into Montana. And um, I stayed with the family, wonderful family. They had sent their kids to western Nebraska to Bible college. And uh, anyway, when the man who was the host of this family said, so you're from Missouri, huh? And I said, yeah, I'm from Missouri. He said, I went to Missouri once. Couldn't see a darn thing. He said, all those trees. And I said, well, some of us kind of like those trees. <laughs> but he was from Montana. He liked big sky country. He liked to be able to see a long ways. Last Lord's Day, when Larry was filling the pulpit, and we were over in that little revival at Granola, Kansas, we stayed with Don and Beth Land, their leaders there in the church. And they live 20 miles out in the country from the little town of Granola and the church there. And so they had literally drove us out to their place. And uh, their three kids all came to Ozark. One teaches in Webb City. One teaches down near Sarcoxy. One runs a wilderness camp in the state of Washington. But anyway, Don and Beth are wonderful Christian people. We stayed with them, and they run a 2,600-acre cow and calf operation out in the Flint Hills of Kansas. And we got up the next morning and just looked out their front door. Oh, my goodness. They'd had a lot of rain. Everything was green. It was beautiful. And you could see a long ways. Sometimes we just need to see the landscape. And in this series of messages, this topical series of messages, where we're talking about the open door that God gives us in life, but sometimes it comes through, as was sung, through some tears. That sometimes there's some open doors that have open wounds. So we're doing this series on suffering and trials. And here's the thing about them. It, we, a few weeks ago, we talked about the sources from which those trials come. Today, I want to move us to the landscape. Just, just what are those trials out there? How could we view all of them so that when they come, we'll be ready for them? And that brings me kind of my, my big idea today for you. Let me just kind of put it in a sentence, and it's this. Knowing the landscape of suffering helps us not be taken off guard. It helps us to not be caught off guard. If we just know kind of what's out there, that will help. You might remember in my little Mark My Word column in our Proclaimer newsletter uh, for April, I put the little story about the bison and the buffalo. I didn't know there was a difference. I don't go hunting. But anyway, there is a difference. And I was told that the bison, when a storm comes, they just face it. And somehow when they face it, it shortens the storm. Don't ask me to explain that, but I know it's true because I read it on the Internet. Anyway, <laughs> you just face it. And there it is. So, what are we to do with this? What about faith? What about knowing the landscape that's out there? Can that help us at all? Well, there's a text that I want us to turn to, and Gordon has referred to it. Marshall had the parallel passage to it in 1 Peter. It's well-worn. You know it. You've heard it before. It's probably frustrated you a few times in life, truth be told. Uh, but it comes from Jesus' half-brother. He wrote probably the Blue Jeans Theology of the New Testament, a very practical book on Christian living in the book of James. He probably was the presider of the Jerusalem congregation, and I want to take you to it today, just a couple little verses from the first chapter of the book of James. Now, James addresses this to the 12 tribes. It probably is a reference to the church, the new Israel, where Jew and Gentile can put their feet under the same table and share communion. So to the 12 tribes, he says this, count it all joy. That's easy, right? No, it's not easy. It's like trying to fly without wings. Count it all joy. It means you have to think about it this way. Count it. The Greek word hegeamai means you reckon it. You, you think about it this way because it's not natural. 
Count it all joy, my brothers. You'll notice it's plural, which clearly indicates it's for the brothers and the sisters in these 12 tribes, which are Christians. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials. But we need to talk about meet. Because the word meet in Greek actually means fall into. And that's how trials happen to us, don't they? We fall into them in this fallen world. The word is used in Jesus' famous parable of the Good Samaritan, that the man who fell among thieves, same word. Sometimes you just fall into trials. And this word trials is, is perasmos. It can be used of the devil tempting us, but when God uses it, he's trying to stretch us. Various trials, of various kinds. I'll come back to various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith, The Greek word for testing means you go through the test and you pass the test and thereby are approved. The testing of your faith produces steadfastness. The word means to endure. The word means to rise up under. It means to be strong underneath it all. Now there's a lot there in those two little verses. We could spend some time on the joy part. I'll come back to that later in our series. We could spend some time on what it produces by way of fruit, steadfastness. We'll come back to that in this series. I want to draw a bead this morning on various kinds. Because if you look at the landscape of trials and the landscape of suffering, you'll notice there are various kinds. Actually, the word kinds is supplied by the translators. There is no word for kinds in the original language. But the word various means multicolored, multifaceted. It means diverse. And it's used in various ways. In Matthew 4, we read that Jesus healed people with various diseases. In 2 Timothy 3, it says that some of us have various desires, and not all of them are holy. In Hebrews 2, it says that their early apostles helped with various miracles. And in Hebrews 9, it talks about various doctrines. So here's the thing. As you look at the landscape of trials and suffering and woundedness, they vary. They vary a lot. If we just looked at Jesus and just considered Paul for a minute, we would know that. I brought with me once again today this book by Dr. Lynn Gardner on Handbook for the Herding. And he made a list on pages 131 and 132, a chart of the trials that Jesus went through. If we tried to make a list of all the landscape of trials today or suffering, we'd be here till the evening service. It'd be a long list. And this list is fairly impressive. Ways Jesus Suffered is the title. Herod tried to kill him when he was a baby. His family tried to take charge of him, declaring he's out of his mind. The brothers did not believe in him. He was tempted by the devil. He was hated by the world. He was rejected by his own people. By the way, there's lots of scriptures for that one. Uh, He says the disciples were dull. And failed, unbelieving response of the crowds, opposed by religious leaders. Listen to this one. He suffered empathetically with the suffering of others. You know what caused Jesus pain? When he saw yours. His soul was sorrowful and trouble. Says it in Gethsemane. He was betrayed by Judas, humiliated and beaten, crucified. And then this one that none of us here has ever experienced. Separation from his father. Jesus suffered. We could make that list. The apostle Paul suffered. A lot of places we could turn to that. I'll just turn to 2 Corinthians because it's magnificent about this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says, Paul says, We were afflicted, we were perplexed, we were persecuted, we were struck down, and we always carry about in our bodies the death of Jesus. You can go to chapter 6 in 2 Corinthians and read this list. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves, says Paul, in every way, by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. Quite a list, don't you think? We could go on over to chapter 11, and he does much of this same thing. He says, are they servants of Christ? He's comparing himself to the false teachers of the day. I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman. He's using sarcasm, of course. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, often near death, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes, less one. 
Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at the sea. On frequent journeys, listen to this next part of the list. Danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at the sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Are you feeling kind of puny right now as a Christian? And then this. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for the churches. Did Jesus have trials? Did Paul have trials? How are we going to look at the landscape? How can we put all of this together? Well, I'm just going to do my best. And I just kind of want to collect as much of the trials of all through the Bible as I can and put them in seven categories. So here are just the first of seven categories of the trials and suffering we face. Here's number one. Attacks from Satan and his minions. Now two weeks ago when we talked about the sources of our trials, we talked about Satan. But I do not want to give the accuser of the brethren and the enemy of our faith any more press. But I'll say this from Revelation 12. He goes after us with his helpers at times, and that's the source. That's, if you didn't include this part of the spirit world factor, you would not be including all of it. It's really true. In fact, if you just think about the book of Revelation for just a minute, chapter 1, the vision of Jesus. Chapter 2 and 3, the, the uh, addresses to the seven churches. 4 and 5, the heavenly scene. And then 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11, troubles in the world. But you get to chapter 12, and you realize why there's troubles in the world. Because the faith has an enemy. And there is this red dragon. John sees this vision in heaven. It's a sign. So it's all taking place in the spiritual realm. He sees this dragon. And the dragon is waiting for this woman who's pregnant to give birth to the child so he can eat the male child. You do catch the symbolism, do you not? Well, God provides for the woman. And he whisks her away to the wilderness where she kept safe. At which point the dragon is very angry. So there's this battle in heaven with the dragon and the others. And the dragon loses and is cast down and takes a third of the stars with him. All very symbolic. And goes to pursue the woman once again. But God gives the woman wings that she can go into the wilderness. And then the dragon provides water to try to drown the woman. And God opens up the earth to swallow up the water. So the dragon is so mad. He is so mad. It says he goes after the other offspring of the woman. And if you don't know who that is, John tells you. Those who obey the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. It's you. It's me. And the enemy and the spirit world is real. Ask our brothers and sisters here today from the country of Haiti. It's real. And, and, and so the devil and his minions is part of the landscape. I don't want to give him any more press. Let's go on. Number two, it's also persecution from people. Persecution from people. The Bible is full of this, is it not? I mean, Israel was persecuted by the Egyptians. The northern kingdom was persecuted by the Assyrians. The southern kingdom was persecuted by the Babylonians. The remnant through which the Messiah would come was persecuted by the Greeks and the Romans. The, Jesus was persecuted by the Jewish leaders. Stephen was persecuted by the synagogue of the freedmen. Paul was persecuted by the Jewish leaders and the Romans. No wonder 2 Timothy 3.12 3, says, Anybody who desires to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. You want to claim one of the promises of God? Here it is will be persecuted. So a part of the landscape is persecution, and it's going on in a big-time way. Once again, I would draw from Dr. Gardner's book here on Handbook. He tells about modern-day sufferers. I remember meeting Joseph Tone from Romania. It was in room 26 of the Missions Building at Ozark Christian College. And he had just recently come to this country because he grew up in Romania, a communist country. He was an atheist, became a believer, fell away, became a believer again. <laughs> and then he started preaching all over Romania when a very evil ruler was taking over that country. And finally they realized that he was a threat. So they arrested him, put him in prison, and they were going to kill him. But when they were going to kill him, he had a little speech for them. And here was the speech. Your supreme weapon is killing. My supreme weapon is dying. 
You know that my sermons on tape have spread all over the country. If you kill me, those sermons will be sprinkled with my blood. Everyone will know I died for my preaching. And everyone who has a tape will pick it up and say, I'd better listen again to what this man preached because he meant it. He sealed it with his life. So, sir, my sermons will speak ten times louder than before. I will actually rejoice in this supreme victory if you kill me. That tends to douse the enthusiasm of the killers. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) And the interrogators sent him home, and they finally expelled him, and he came to the United States of America, and he taught at Wheaton College. Yeah, we have to admit the reality, do we not? That not only the devil and his minions is part of the landscape, but also persecution is part of the landscape. Let me give you a third one, and it's this, storms in a fallen world. Now, on Wednesday nights, we've been studying Genesis 1 through 11, as many of you know. But we could go to the flood narrative, 6, 7, 8, 9 of Genesis. Say, well, the flood, that destroyed. Yeah, but God brought that flood. God did that. We could go to Jesus calming the storm after they woke him up from sleeping on the cushion. And that other time he walked on the water and calmed the storm. But Jesus took the storm away. What happens when the storm stays? It wipes out a third of the city. Christians don't get a pass on this. No, sometimes. And so I put down Acts 27. Because Acts 27 is a story of a shipwreck described by Dr. Luke in tremendous nautical, I didn't say naughty, I said nautical terms. Amazing detail, amazing accuracy in the ancient world. But that ship that Paul was on, on his fourth missionary journey, comes into difficulty with a storm and crashes in to the area called Malta, a little island, and God never stopped it. I was so proud of Dr. George Wood. I've never met him in person. I've heard him speak in person. Dr. George Wood was the president of the Assemblies of God denomination in Springfield, Missouri. And I heard him speak when my good brother Woody Wilkinson got his doctorate degree. A bunch of us went down there, and George Wood spoke that day. I had listened to a sermon from him, and the reason was because he preached a sermon from Acts 27 on God's non-interventions, which for a Pentecostal theologian was quite interesting to me. Because a lot of us preachers get in dangerous ground when we say, you know, if you just had more faith, this wouldn't happen. Watch that like a hawk. So here's a Pentecostal theologian that I'm respecting. He's saying, no, why didn't God stop those planes? He preached this after 9-11. Preaching Today picked it up as a ministry of Christianity Today and published the tape. And I listened to it. I thought, wow, this is really something. And he asked the question, why didn't God stop the planes? Because sometimes Christians don't get a pass on this. Sometimes we go through, as Heidi sang, the trail of tears, if you will. Yeah, here's another side of this, though, that we need to reckon with, I think. And without giving us too much of a big head, what the non-believers don't understand is sometimes they get saved by the skin of the chinny-chin-chin because we're there. Paul saved, God saved all 276 people on that boat because the apostle Paul was on it. And see, I think our non-believers don't even understand that they may be just barely surviving because there's a remnant in the United States of America that still loves God. So, storms. What about this one? Number four, chronic illness. Chronic illness, Matthew 8 and 9. Listen, in a fallen world, we all should expect a cold, the flu, measles, mumps, broken bones. But what happens when it's chronic? Cancer. MS. My cousin Tim that played for the Yankees has MS. What about diabetes, our two daughters with type 1? What about arthritis and heart disease and stroke and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's? What about chronic disease? Chronic disease can be a number one pain intruder. Medical expenses mount. Lifestyles are restricted. Doctors, going to doctors becomes our social life when we get our age. What about Matthew 8 and 9? What Matthew does is he collects a series of miracles by Jesus in three sets of three. So Jesus encounters a leper. He encounters a centurion servant's slave. He he encounters a a, 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 a mother-in-law with a fever. A paralyzed guy let down through a roof. 
a woman with a bleeding problem for 12 years, and a girl who's died. Chronic. Chronic illness can do a number on us. Here's a fifth area. It can often lead with chronic illness to the next, mental anguish. Part of the landscape of suffering is just the mental side that goes with it. Mental anguish. My friend, Dr. Gary Zustiak, has been climbing on our frames a bunch of times lately by saying, you preachers need to preach more on mental illness. And I have to say, Gary, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I, you're right. I haven't done much of that in my years. And I suppose the reason is because I've lived in this little bubble and been very protected and quite healthy. I remember years ago when we'd have somebody in our church in Illinois say, well, I couldn't come to church last night because I had a migraine. You know my sensitivity for that? Oh, grow up, you big baby. It tends to cut your counseling load down quite a bit. But anyway, <laughs> I said, oh, for heaven's sakes, it's a bad headache until I got one. And when I got one and it flattened me between semesters and literally went to the office one day and about an hour later I went home and went to bed. Then you all of a sudden find that no, there is some mental anguish that goes along with these kinds of things. Um, the passages that I've listed on the text, on the screen. King Saul. I don't know exactly what to do with this. My dad called me one day and said, what do we do with this evil spirit from the Lord that affects King Saul? I said, let me pull Gleason Archer off the shelf, who was an Old Testament scholar, dad. And the only thing that calmed him down was David's lyre, David's harp. Do you know, this book has a whole chapter on the value of music when you're suffering chronically and mental anguish. That surprised me because the guy that wrote this is pretty left brain. And for him to write a whole chapter on the value of music that can help with chronic illness and, and mental anguish. Wow. And I put down here about 1 Kings 19. You know that passage. I mean, you know, Elijah the prophet had stood up against the 450 prophets of Baal. Fire came down from heaven. Everything looked good until Jezebel went after him. And he got a case of depression. And what about that passage we read earlier? Upon me, says Paul, daily was the anxiety of the churches. I have to be honest with you. There are nights... When I wake up in the middle of the night, I'm thinking about some of you. And man, I think I know just a skosh, just a skosh of what Paul is talking about, of the anxiety of the churches. <laughs> and I read that 10 to 25% of women are chronically depressed. 5 to 12% of men are chronically depressed. That's part of the landscape. Here's a sixth one, and that's just physical needs. We all have physical needs because we're all physical people. We need to eat. We need to drink. We need to sleep. If you don't eat, you can't function well. If you don't drink, you'll get dehydrated. dehydrated. If you don't sleep, you will be in a brain fog. And I like what Dr. Fred Craddock says. He says, sometimes the best thing we can do and the most spiritual thing we can do is go to bed. Probably right. Exodus 16, they were hungry, cried out to Moses, we need food. So God gave them, what's it? What's it? That's what manna means. What's it? You scrape it off the little stuff off the leaves, the hoarfrost, and you make it into bread. What? It's manna. That's what it is. Well, now we're thirsty. We ate bread, and now we're thirsty. Oh, you people. So he brings water out of a rock for them. They had physical needs. In Mark 8, I'm so touched by this. Jesus has had people following him for three days without a meal. They've had nothing to eat. And Jesus says, we need to feed these people. I can't send them home lest they faint on the way. So he performs a miracle and feeds the, ready? 4,000. He's already fed the five. He now feeds the four. Here's the final one. Family pressures. That's never been an issue for you, has it? 
Family pressures. That's sometimes part of the landscape. Family pressures. Look at these passages. Genesis chapter 12 to 50. Matthew chapter 10. Luke chapter 14. Listen, your family's your first church. Your family's school district number one. It matters. And what creates anxiety is when it goes belly up. It's not fun. John Ortberg says he reads through Genesis 12 through 50, the Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph narratives. He says, these people need a therapist. <laughs> He's right. Sibling rivalry, anger, murder, adultery, polygamy. It's a mess. Family pressures. Jesus in Matthew 10, when he's getting the disciples ready to go out for their short-term missions trip, he quotes Malachi and says, um, won't be easy because daughter-in-law is going to hate mother-in-law. In Luke 14, he said, unless you hate your father and your mother and your brother and your sister and even your own life, you cannot be my disciple. Family stuff. All I'd have to say, though, for our online audience, because we have people watching in Africa and Romania and other places, all I'd have to say to this audience here is Jillian and Veronica. Because you've seen their pictures on the news. But for those who that two ladies trying to do the right thing, get abducted and murdered, and here's the funny part, not funny at all, that happens 90% of the time from family members. That's the landscape. At least that's how I've grouped it today. I don't know how you'd group it necessarily. But the landscape of suffering is big sky country. That's why I say knowing the landscape of suffering helps us not be caught off guard. We can be like the bison and we can face it. Let me, as I close today, read you one little piece and then refer to two scriptures. Here, here's the piece. This was, I have her permission to say this, but one of our newest members, she was in first service this morning, Judy Mauser. She wrote this in an email to me, and you'll be able to relate to it. This is what she says. Have you ever thought that a person in grief is unusually beautiful? And I answered that question by saying, no. I have pondered this lately and did a search of faces of grief. You can see some on the screen. Each image I saw was more beautiful than the last, drawing you in. You didn't have to know the source, but you can see the pain. It's real in the face, in the eyes, in the mouth. You can feel it with them, yet you not know them or their pain. Unlike the bitterness and resentment that may follow, grief stri strips us of all facade and pretense. What remains is raw and vulnerable, completely unpretentious. It's honest. I suppose there is a certain beauty, isn't there? When it comes to um, certain difficulties. You can see it in the face. So I want to leave you, since we talked earlier about Jesus and Paul, I want to leave you with Jesus and Paul. Here's Jesus from the Hebrew writer. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, uh, that would be you and me, we do that. He himself, Jesus, likewise partook of the same things, we call that the incarnation, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it's not with angels that he helps, but he helps those of the offspring of Abraham. Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers. That's the Christmas story. He had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people for because he himself has suffered all types of landscape for Jesus when tempted he is able to help those who are being tempted that's Jesus now Paul and then we're going to stand and sing in that marvelous 8th chapter of the book of Romans it's so great <laughs> Paul says, creation groans, we groan. Guess who else groans? Verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also groans. <laughs> when we don't know how, actually it can be translated either way. We don't know how to pray. We don't know what to pray. Have you ever known how to pray, but you didn't know what? Have you ever prayed what, but you couldn't frame up the words? You didn't know the how? Likewise, the Spirit helps us when we don't know how to pray, but with groanings too deep for words intercedes for the saints. You know, that's a verse that deals with landscape. Some days you don't even know how to pray because the landscape is just so full. 
I really, to be honest with you, I wasn't sure what I was going to invite you to today. <laughs> I suppose if you don't have the help of Jesus, who understands the landscape of suffering, you might want to run to Jesus and accept Jesus and follow Jesus and be baptized into Jesus, maybe. Or maybe you're here today and you really need to lean into this community of faith called Park Plaza because you need some help. Maybe you're identified with one of those things. Maybe, maybe physical pressures, maybe chronic illness, maybe mental anguish. Maybe, maybe that's where you are right now. And maybe we just need to have you come and pray. I don't know. But we're going to stand. We're going to sing. Out of my difficulty, Jesus, I come. If you have a public decision in faith today, we'll be right here to greet you. Let's stand together. Let's sing. I come into thy freedom, gladness and light. Jesus, I come to thee. Out of my sickness into thy help, out of my want and into thy rest. upon you just a bit. Will you sit for just a moment, please? We do have some very special guests with us today, and I want them to help us end our service. Of course, we are so blessed here at Park Plaza to have Obius Exilus and his sweet family as a part of our church family. It's just so great to have them here when he's not out preaching somewhere. But since 1974, this congregation has supported the Haitian Christian Mission in Haiti. And we have some very special guests here today. Um, I could not have been more proud of our congregation last night because the folks up here on the front row were part of a 50th year celebration. Do the math. 1974 plus 50 equals now. <laughs> and so anyway, man, we were there. About nine or ten of us, I think, came for the celebration over at the venue there in Carthage, celebrating the ministry of this wonderful uh, ministry and family. Um, Stephen Prophet, we called him Stephen, was, was ahead of us in school just a little bit in the 70s. But he came here to church. He came here to church to Park Plaza. And uh, when he got ready to go back to Haiti and plant dozens of churches with 6,000 people attending them, hundreds of baptisms, feeding 2,800 kids meals daily, ministering to, it's, it's a phenomenal ministry. Um, some of the Park Plaza elders, I'm so thankful for the, for the leadership here. They said to Stephen, how are you going to do this? And he just said, we're going to depend on the Lord. Well, our guys were smart enough to realize the capabilities. And so Park Plaza in 1974 began to support Haitian Christian Mission and Stephen and Betty Prophet with $190 per month. Now, this is 1977. 74, excuse me, 74. 
So just think of what that is in a missions budget at that point. Now, of course, since we've been supporting them all these years since, uh, you know, that money has increased. And from time to time, extra gifts as well. But I wish all of you could have been there last night. And that's not a chastisement. It's just you would have been thrilled with just the, the wonderful ministry. So uh, Jimmy is here today with his family. I'm going to have Jimmy speak and pray for us here in just a minute, just a minute. But I want you to welcome these. And Betty... Uh, Stephen's uh, wife, Stephen Prophet's wife, Betty Prophet, is here. She's carried on the ministry because he's been gone now three years, been in the presence of Jesus. Betty, please come up here. Will you welcome the representatives from Haitian Christian <laughs> Mission? And it's so good to have them all here. I want to... Uh, I want Betty to speak a word to us here, and then Jim, you come and say what you want to say, and then have our closing prayer. Betty, please, hold yes. it right up there so we can hear you well. Right there. All right. What a blessing to be home. <laughs> yes. I feel Park Plaza is my home. And we're always talking about Park Plaza. As it's already to said, you know, 1974, you are, you are HCM. Because mm. you sent us to Haiti, the mission in Haiti. It's your mission. Thank you. And thank you so much. And uh, thank you, thank you. I know your reward is not on this earth, but your reward is in heaven. Continue to do the good work uh, supporting missionaries all over the world. Uh, to, so in the last day, God will tell all of you, well done, my children. Thank you so much for everything you have done for Haiti. As uh, that sermon this morning, and I can see Haiti, but in the midst of all the trial, all the difficulty, God is in control. Thank you so much. Thank you, Betty. Thank you so much. Jimmy, come on up. I might want to introduce your family. This is one of the sons of the family. There are several family members, but this is Jimmy, and we've had a chance to get acquainted through Obis and others. Anyway, I um, want to mention this. This was very touching to me. Uh, uh, Betty mentioned about the difficult. You all know that Haiti is in crisis, and gangs are controlled. One of the things that was so touching to me last night was one of the pastors there uh, was asked, uh, if you, because one of the gang situations was right there with one of the churches. Mm -hmm. And they asked, should we get you out of there? And the pastor said, how can I tell my people to trust in God if you take me out of here? Yeah. Now, folks, that's faith. <laughs> so give us a greeting, Jimmy. Yes. Tell us how we can still be involved and then pray for us. Oh, my. Thank you so much. Uh, Pastor Scott, and uh, we're incredibly grateful for the partnership of Park Plaza from the very beginning. Uh, I got involved actively with the ministry about three years ago after uh, Dad went home to heaven, and uh, it's been such a, such a treat to be on the road and meeting many of you guys that either uh, were my dad's friends or went to school with them. And um, it's been incredibly uh, fulfilling just to hear the stories. And so um, Haiti's a very difficult place now, but Haitian Christian Mission has managed through, with, with the grace of God, to continue to do ministry in some of the toughest places uh, in Haiti. Our pastors are the beacon of those communities uh, and, and in each one of our communities. And so the way you support them, the way you continue to support them, and, and pour the resource into them, even when uh, they're under attack. Um, you know, those churches become places of refuge where people run to um, and, and seek shelter and food. And families that don't even go to those churches end up in those churches receiving the word of God in times of crisis. So it's been phenomenal uh, to, be, to witness that. And we know that God's got the last word on Haiti. We see um, we have international attention uh, that's, that's being put on Haiti now. So we see some, some very, we see the light at the end of the tunnel. So continue praying for us. I think that's the main thing and continue supporting us. And I have my wife Viola here and my uh, son Colton and my daughter Leah. They travel with us and we had that's the great. pleasure of having uh, Pastor Scott do the closing prayer for us, which was super symbolic because it all started with, with Park Plaza. So we're incredibly 
incredibly grateful to be here this morning. Thank you. Thank you so yes. much. Let me do this. I want him to close our service out with prayer. I'm going to do something. I know the kids will love me for this, but I'm going to ask Larry if he wouldn't mind. After your prayer, could we have the family go out in the foyer so that people could greet you? That would be great. Let's stand together, and Jimmy will lead us in prayer. And then while we're singing, we'll let the family get out in the foyer. I know you'll want to greet them, but we just praise God for what's going on through this wonderful mission. And we're just, it's, it's humbling uh, to be part of Park Plaza and be part of this. But thank you for doing what you're doing. Please, please pray. Let's pray. Dear Godly Father, we're so thankful that you've given us all opportunity, Lord, to uh, be part of your work and be part of your kingdom. Father, we uh, are so thankful for a wonderful word this morning. We ask you, Lord, not only to uh, help us hear it, but to apply it, uh, Father, moving forward in our lives and continue to spread the gospel, as you said in Matthews, um, and throughout the world, in every corner of the world where, where darkness um, uh, uh, lies, Father God. So we ask you, Lord, to uh, send us home safely, uh, dear God, and continue to bless Park Plaza tremendously so that we can continue to be a blessing to others. And we pray in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen.